you probably know about the three common states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. But did you know that you can get different types of solid with different properties? The four types of solid you'll be asked about in this exam will be metallic, molecular, covalent network, and ionic. Some of those words like covalent and ionic should sound pretty familiar by now, but what about the others? We'll go through the types of solid now after a quick recap on the types of forces we're going to be talking about. Imagine for a moment some water, or H2O. The forces holding the hydrogens and oxygen together are called intramolecular forces, but in a drop of water, what's keeping the molecules held together? What joins one molecule to its neighbour? To hold one molecule of water to another, we need a different kind of force. These are called intermolecular forces, or sometimes London forces. We've drawn intramolecular forces in blue. In red now are the intermolecular forces. These two words are so horribly similar that it will be easier to remember the concepts as forces within a molecule, and forces between several different molecules. Questions you'll be asked will be about intermolecular forces, the forces between molecules. In general, and pretty much always, the intramolecular forces will be much stronger than the weak intermolecular forces. And this makes sense when you think about it. When you pour some water out of a glass, but leave some in it, you're effortlessly breaking the intermolecular forces. However, splitting up a single molecule of water into hydrogen and oxygen, which means breaking the intramolecular forces, is quite a bit harder. Let's take a look at molecular solids first, as these will be the most familiar to you. A molecular solid is, perhaps you've guessed it, a solid composed entirely of molecules. Fancy that. Molecules in the way that we refer to them here are either nonpolar or only slightly polar. Often they'll be composed of more than one of the same type of atom. Let's take chlorine for example. In a single molecule of chlorine, two chlorine atoms have strong covalent bonds. But of course, we don't care about those, we care about the weak intermolecular forces between several molecules of chlorine. These are very weak, just like they were in water. Not only do you need to be able to identify what kinds of forces are in a substance, but you need to be able to talk about what that means for the substance. We know that chlorine, Cl2 for example, is held together by weak intermolecular forces. This means that chlorine has a low melting point. Most molecules with weak intermolecular forces have very low melting points because not much energy is needed to break these forces. Chlorine also has a low boiling point. This is explained using the same logic as before. When something gets boiled, we're breaking apart one molecule from its neighbour even more than when we melt it. This can be done at a lowish temperature because so little energy is needed to break the weak intermolecular forces. Chlorine does not conduct electricity. In order for a substance to be able to conduct electricity, there must be mobile charged particles that can move about freely. In chlorine, there are no free charged particles, so no electricity gets conducted. Some molecular substances are soluble in water. Chlorine is not one of these, but that doesn't mean it's impossible for a molecular substance to be soluble in water. It all depends on polarity. When a molecule is polar, and Cl2 is not polar, the slightly negative end of that molecule gets attracted towards the H's of the water, and the slightly positive end gets attracted to the O. If these attractions are strong enough, they will overcome the covalent bonds, the intramolecular forces, within the molecule. This means that the molecule gets dissolved. 